There we are. Uh, so um, welcome to uh, the first of the summer term seminars of the Socialist History Seminar at the Institute of Historical Research. Obviously, we're on Zoom rather than in Room 301, which is probably just as well, um, because I don't think we'd gather too many uh, in that rather chilly room uh, on the third floor at the OHR on a sunny day. Um, just a few opening remarks. Obviously, um, lots of momentous things in the news today, but um, just to underline that, of course, the London Socialist Historians Group are the organisers of the seminar, long-term supporters of the Palestinian cause uh, and all the protests that have gone on UK-based in the UK. 14th demonstration last Saturday with a quarter of a million people on it is quite a remarkable uh, sustained record of protest. I don't think it's been paralleled, frankly, in the UK. Uh, going back into the time of the Chartists, um, it is quite a, you know, an interesting historical point, quite aside from the political impact, um, and also, of course, to the student encampments which exist in uh, the US, but also increasingly in, in the in the UK, uh, and you know they're clearly having an impact, um, and they will need to continue to having that impact. So that's just to make a, a general point. I was talking to, um, earlier um, before we formally started about the, the 1980s um, and just to flag up um, we're still looking at doing something on the 40th anniversary of the mind strike I think I found something if I can persuade them that might do something interesting on the on the support groups um, which are, there is a book um, but there's a lot of stuff out there that's not really that well documented uh, there's a new book out um, this, this week or last week uh, on the GLC in 1984 chronicling that particular year uh, and looking at the politics uh, that the GLC had and uh, the alternative uh, sort of position that, that, that was being developed by Livingston and John McDonald and so on. Um, so there's, there's quite a bit of stuff uh, out there about the 1980s. There is also, and we'll be dealing with this uh, in the autumn term, uh, somebody who's based in Pittsburgh has written a biography of Jerry Healy. Um, which uh, doesn't look particularly complimentary. <laughs> I can't imagine why that would be. But uh, it's published by Pluto, so I think I'm I'm content that it's not some kind of, you know, just an unpleasant hatchet job, although that perhaps would be murder. So that, that's uh, something for, for the autumn, the autumn term programme will be out uh, later. But um, we've now accumulated uh, a reasonable number, so we'll kick off. Um, tonight we're going to be uh, hearing um, about Socialist Alternatives, uh, a project in the 1980s. I know there were several people uh, here that were involved with it, uh, but particularly the speaker, um, who was the was the uh, I don't know how to describe it, the moving force behind it, or the editor of the of the magazine, um, and of course one other person who well, sadly uh, hasn't joined us tonight. Um, I think he's still perfecting his uh, his salmon recipe that he unveiled yesterday on uh, Sunday brunch. Uh, in the UK uh, was Keir Starmer, um, an interesting, the young Starmer, uh, as it were. Um, so uh, I think without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Ben, and uh, you know, the meeting is yours. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to talk about uh, old times. Uh, I, can I share uh, my screen? Because I actually did uh, prepare some slides for you guys. Uh, you can. Well, I need to, in order to do that, I'll need to make you... Yeah, you uh, need to um, allow me to do it. Yeah, hang on. There's, there's a way of doing this. But why uh, did you do that? Yeah. Uh, well, it won't take too long. Um, Maybe by making me co-host. Um, uh, well, I'll make you the host. So you're now the host. You should I, be able to share your okay. screen. I agree. Okay, here we are. Um, here we are. Okay, so well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak about the uh, that socialist alternatives uh, experience uh, from the um, I think it was from really nineteen eighty four to um, nineteen eighty eight, and um, so I called the talk. You know, you asked me for for a name, and I couldn't find anything more sexy than the uh, 1980s attempt to search for a new revolutionary subject, which might account for why we're not getting too many people <laughs> here today. And um, 
So, you know, Socialist Alternatives is this uh, most famous magazine that no one read and only famous because uh, of uh, one of our um, editorial members who I understand has gathered a little bit of a following uh, in Britain lately. And so I looked a little bit around, you know, about what was said about that magazine. So uh, if you haven't heard of it, you know, as Vice told us, it's because actually no one read it. Um, it was a short-lived 1980s magazine, which argued precisely, I agree with that, that the left should pay more attention to the environment and to feminism. Yet, uh, Mr. Storm on Desert Island did said we were out to change the world and he said some things that were daft. Maybe uh, I didn't, I don't know. It's become less dogmatic today, which would be happy to hear about. And um, so that was The Guardian. And The Economist, for its part, said that, quite factual, actually, you know, um, the editorial board of Socialist Alternatives was a tiny magazine, absolutely right, that follows the revolutionary ideas of Michel Pablo, obscure Greek Trotskyite, uh, and meeting under the guidance of a willowy figure known as the Frenchman, hiding behind the nom de guerre and pen names. And um, its members included, of course, uh, Kia. Um, his articles are hard to decipher. I read a few uh, lately of the old ones. His main contribution is to take the magazine to the printers and distribute it to bookshops. That's not exactly true, but never mind. It was the backroom guy, the one who did the hard work, and that hurts my pride because I'm actually the guy who did all the work, not just the hard work. Uh, so, and the rest sat around and talked. That is insulting. And our friends in the socialist worker said that, you know, uh, it was part of a loosely left-wing broad milieu, I think you pronounce it, mostly drifting rightwards. Maybe he was, but I certainly wasn't and still haven't, as you might be able to gather from this talk. The magazine had to produce socialist alternatives was Starmer writ large. Um, rather than any clear left-wing politics, it preferred instead to reflect debates. It was unpopular even amongst the dispirited labor left in retreat after the recent defeat of the minor strike and of penism. So as you learn, you know, we kind of stole um, Whole Foods Sun from um, the SWP, and I'm sure this is where this, uh, this article comes from. They're still um, a little bit bitter after all these years. So it is true that we shared a, we shared a flat above a brothel in Highgate when we moved down from Oxford. And um, as the new statement said, you know, the magazine was obscure and also atrociously written Trotsky pamphlet uh, for which he was once a co-editor. And uh, so we were at the softer end of British Trotskyism and uh, was a magazine published by the Pabloite sect of the same name, which ran for five issues. So let's look at that. It's actually six issues, but you know, close enough. There's an article in the Independent that's actually quite uh, factual about what it was. I think they picked up some stuff I wrote on um, on Twitter because what happened after a while when um, Kier became a labor leader and started to become so right-wing and people associated him with socialist alternatives, I kind of uh, got really pissed off and thought I should come out of my uh, clandestine uh, uh, being. And so that's how I think they got it. Anyway, is, um, is useful socialism is entertaining. So it was entertaining apparently. And um, I wrote, we were radical anti-imperialistic or socialists, which I stand by. Um, as the leader of the seven member editorial team, including Starmer. The magazine was inspired by uh, Michalis Raptis, also known as Michel Pablo, a Greek former Trotskyist known as Pablo, whose faction, the Pabloites, wanted to broaden socialism to include feminism and green politics. First issue was published in July 86, proclaiming that its vision of socialism was the generalized self management of society as a whole. 
It claimed to be concretely working towards a radical extension of popular control over wealth and power by integrating the traditional labor movement with new social movements. That's the most, the fairest description of what we were doing I've been able to find in the uh, MSM as it's known today. And so Pabloid sect, what's that about? Let's have a look a little bit at uh, who Pablo was as a figure because he's actually extremely not well known. So uh, Michel Baptiste was born in um, Alexandria in 1911, died in Athens in 96. He was the international secretary of the fourth international from 43, so the middle of second world war to 1963 for over 20 years and then leader of the so-called international revolutionary Marxist tendency, first of the fourth international, and then just dropping any reference to the fourth international from the 60s to 1989. He was a revolutionary Marxist activist and participant in global South revolutions. After World War II, World War II the hopes of the fourth international that there would be a world revolution pretty much on the model of the uh, Russian revolution after World War I, were soon dashed. And um, we saw a consolidation of both imperialism and Stalinism on the other side. And Pablo started to look for new revolutionary subjects to complement the uh, Western working class as the vanguard of new world revolution as he saw it then. And pushed the uh, Fourth International to uh, break out of its propagandistic activity, overcome petty bourgeois social base. I don't know that we've ever managed that, but there you go, and actively join in uh, revolutionary mass movements. So he oriented the uh, Fourth International to global South anti-imperialist and decolonial movements, first joining um, the Yugoslav brigades and also experiments with workers' self-management there then giving material help to the Algerian revolution. And uh, in fact, the fourth international were the first to really uh, give support to the uh, Algerian revolution in, uh, in France, right? He actually organized, so it was real material support. He organized a uh, arms factory in Morocco for the um, National Liberation Front of um, Algeria and, and also got involved in a scheme to produce hundreds of millions of counterfeited French money, which uh, landed him in jail in Holland. And when he got, when he was arrested, he was effectively betrayed by the rest of the leadership of the Fourth International. And in spite of that, there was an extremely large international uh, solidarity campaign for Michel and uh, Sal Santon, who was the other guy from the Fourth International who had been uh, arrested. And many um, UK Labour MPs and many intellectuals the world over actually joined the campaign and they were actually released after a couple of years. And in, in detention, Pablo had time to think and he wrote some very interesting uh, articles and pamphlets and essays, one on uh, women liberation, integrating uh, sexual liberation in a way that was very new for certainly the fourth international, but more generally the communist movement at the time. Also uh, thinking more deeply about the perils to democracy of one party states and uh, on the economic front, writing in favor of a really long uh, new economic policy in which material incentives and not just um, ideological incentives would actually uh, be central. So, you know, some form of a market being present in the socialist trend, uh, transition. In 63, in 62, sorry, he moved to Algeria and became uh, one of the main counselors of uh, Ahmed Ben Bella, the first uh, president of um, independent Algeria, and had a very, um, had a role in. Uh, drafting the decrees for self-managing the um, settler um, properties that had been abandoned and also uh, some of the uh, industrial um, enterprises. Um, that actually was a very uh, important 
experience. It was supported even by the um, FLN Congress, where mm -hmm. the left there, led by uh, Mohamed Arbi, who would remain a close ally of uh, Michel for all his life, was uh, active until uh, there was the coup by the uh, military in 65. Ben Bella was jailed, so was uh, Mohamed Harbi, and uh, Pablo just uh, made it out of, um, of Algeria because he had been kind of singled out as the uh, communistic influence on, um, on the Ben Bella government. Uh, he was also a central figure while in Algiers, uh, to what was termed at the time, and I think there's a book of that name, the um, revolutionary Mecca. So he met all the revolutionary leaders of the um, anti-imperialist, uh, anti-colonial movement of the time and famously helped uh, uh, procure arms for Che Guevara's uh, mission in Congo, right? And... Um, after this, he remained active in supporting uh, socialism in the Arab world and also the armed struggle in Palestine and supported the armed resistance in Greece and worked tirelessly to get uh, Mohamed Harbi out of prison and keep a campaign for the liberation of uh, Ben Bella, which would be, um, who would be freed in 81 if memory serves. And um, he had this life in which he didn't just write about um, how to uh, well, find this new revolutionary subject, but he was active in experiments. Like somebody called him the, the League of Revolution. And I think that is true to, in a sense, because after Algeria, he went to... Uh, helped the um, underground movement in Greece, and then was in Chile, uh, again, uh, developing ideas for worker self-management uh, just before the coup and managed to, it wasn't there, the coup but managed to, exp to um, escape. His wife was there and managed to uh, take her out. And after this, he was present uh, at the um, April revolution in, um, in Portugal, and also are very active in the um, 1968 movement in France. So to him, the, um, the, the May 68 experiment in France really validated the aspirations to self-management and personal liberation and the new social movement. So really a way to open up and broaden the uh, revolutionary Marxist tradition. And uh, in 1988, the uh, is you know um, IRMT International Revolutionary Marxist Tendency split on the question of joining or not the Green Parties. So Michel Pablo is a very interesting character, also just because of the name, uh, because in Orthodox Trotskyist. Um, Trotskyite circles, Pabloite is mostly synonymous with liquidationism and is a term of abuse. And it's very strange because to those people, the Pabloites are not the people who work with Pablo, okay, but they are the on people on who work with, um, let me see if I can mute the people. Yeah, great. Uh, the, the folks we, who worked with more of the, I don't know what's, uh, do, do you remember, Derek, what it's called? International Secretariat, I think, of the of the Fourth International. So even his name was uh, Pablo Ait was taken away from him in this uh, in this weird sense. And we know very little of, of what he really stood for. But he continued to evolve a revolutionary Marxist political thought and practice that sought to understand the evolution of imperialism and the socialist countries and to identify new revolutionary subjects, movements, and alliances. This he termed the self-managed republic, a radically democratic socialist society with collective ownership and grassroots management of the means of production in harmony with the natural environment, promoting full individual development and autonomy and respecting their social, sexual, and cultural dimensions. I think this is the longest sentence of the whole presentation, so hopefully you, you live through it. Uh, the new society, inspired by 
This new society inspired by what he termed in his later years, the excess of consciousness of some of its members is to be prefigured by our political and personal practices. And that point to me was extremely inspiring from the beginning. And I think also why amongst many Trotskyite sects, if you want to call them that, we were one that never had any uh, history or accusations of personal or sexual abuse amongst our members, which is quite nice. After the disintegration of the international tendency following the 1988 World Conference and the split of adjoining the Green Parties, Pablo briefly rejoined the Fourth International before returning to Greece. There, as a columnist, he turned his attention to the new contradiction between imperialism and sovereignty, most infamously, depending on your point of view, by supporting Serbia in the late 90s against the uh, NATO assault. Today, Pabloism remains a term of abuse in some Trotskyite circles. Bizarrely, in the UK, Pabloite is the safe description of Andrew Coates, whom I invited by didn't respond, a Ukraine Zionism supporting labor right who, as far as I recall, gravitated distantly around French Pabloite circles in the 80s without working with socialist alternatives. So the willowy figure is me. Uh, so this is me reading the um, Communist Party's um, offering towards uh, young French people was called Piv Gadget at the time. And this is me a few years later um, when I was preparing uh, coming to Oxford uh, to wage a bloody revolution. Uh, so how I learned to love Pabloism. I was born in 63 in Lyon, France to a left-wing middle-class family. I was autistic, but unrecognized at the time. I still am autistic, of course and hypersensitive to social injustice from my earliest day. I hated school and school hated me back. I was a voracious reader since forever and I became a lifelong anti-imperialist, I think on um, 11th of September, 1973, the time of the Chile coup that I saw uh, in the newspaper. And from that moment onward, I read uh, nearly daily, you know, newspapers like Liberation, the, the, daily newspaper of the far left, l'humanité of the Communist Party, Le Monde of uh, everybody, uh, and Le Monde Libertaire was a weekly, occasional weekly of um, the anarchist uh, current in France. I identified most with the anarchists at the time. At 12, I got into rock and roll. I dropped out of high school and dropped into drugs. In 1980, I met a Bernard Chalcha, if uh, you want the crunchy details, it was a, in a drug deal in a punk rock concert. And uh, Bernard was Lyon correspondent for Liberation. He recruited me to Pabloism. Uh, I think he showed me how you could be both libertarian, revolutionary and Marxist scientific, which you know I think appealed to my autism in some sense. And he introduced me uh, to Maurice Najman. Maurice Najman was the leader of the uh, high school students in uh, May 68. And uh, one of the most, uh, how can I say, most extraordinary intellects I've ever had uh, the good fortune to meet. He, and he, is, he was and he still is a major influence on my, on my uh, political thinking. Uh, Maurice was a journalist also, and uh, very. I need to respond to my son, but I'll be with you in a second, guys. Just a second.
Sorry about that, guys. So Maurice Nijman, a major influence, and uh, the you know with Pablo, the major thinker of our of our tendency. In August 1981, I went to uh, Orefto. I wrote it wrongly there, Greece, with uh, Bernard, and there I met Pablo in person and his friend Maria Beckett. Uh, Maria was uh, an extraordinary figure. She uh, she actually brought the Greek junta to uh, be condemned for human rights abuses at the um, European Council to the point that they actually chose to leave the council rather than to stay. And she had worked closely with Michel during the um, the junta and she had even, so she was a daughter of the ruling class or the bourgeoisie, the high bourgeoisie in uh, Greece. And she had actually gone to train with the um, um, Palestinian guerrillas in um, Lebanon, if I recall right. And she'd become very good friends with the whole of the PLO leadership. And in December 81, she took me to visit uh, Beirut, where I met uh, the PLO leadership and visited Sabra and Shatila camp and really heard uh, directly from Palestinians and, you know, became a lifelong supporter and very sensitive to the Palestinian cause. I dabbled a little bit in Pabloite politics in Lyon, dropped out of uni and really got more in, into sex, drugs and rock and roll at the time. In 83, at uh, Maria's suggestion, I prepared for the Oxbridge exams, got accepted to Oriol College with a scholarship. And that was uh, in December. And then I still had to wait until uh, September to go to, um, to Oxford. So I went. Uh, Stayed in Paris where I worked to uh, just make money as I waited to go to Oxford. And I literally went to knock on the uh, IOMT's door where I saw, well, the names are not important. But anyway, I said, uh, I'm going to Oxford and I want to start a group and start a magazine there. Are you guys interested? And they said, yeah, that's a good idea. We'll support you. I mean, you know, I already had a personal connection with Pablo at the time, so they didn't... Uh, freak out too much, or maybe they checked who I was and then they went. So then I spent the next few months really getting familiarized with UK politics that I knew nothing about. I'm uh, under the guidance of Maurice, we knew everybody everywhere. And I met Hilary Wainwright, Ken Livingstone, got in touch with Tony Benn, I read a lot, and we agreed that the Labour Party was the place to start working from and around. So that's how the magazine came. Uh, when I got into Oxford in September 84, I joined the Labour Club and started promoting Pabloite ideas that I was enthusiastic about. And I was elected chair of the Labour Club at the end of my first term. I created a OULC uh, term program that really prefigured the socialist alternative editorial line. So with Hillary Wainwright, someone from workers' plans, Tony Benn, and other people like that. A dozen people showed interest in the ideas, including John Foote, being uh, Paul Foote's uh, son, and his then partner, Jen Alexander, Alex Harvey, and Emma Foote. Kirst Thomas, who was fresh from Leeds, was, according to um, John's recollection, but I think it's, uh, it, you know, now I remember also, uh, selling the militant outside the uh, Oxford uh, University Labour Club meetings, believe it or not, and had invited Derek Hatton to Oxford. However, he joined us very soon. There's one thing that is strange is I don't really remember having to uh, argue very long or very deep with him for him to join us. Although, you know, in terms of uh, trot groups, I think you could hardly be more distant from the militant tendency than, uh, than we were at the time. So we, want, we launched an affiliate of the IRMT. It was actually called not Socialist Alternatives, but Socialist Self Management was the group. And some historic UK Pabloite activists joined us, such as John and Ellen Malos, George Shaw, Neville Alexander, and in 1986, we finally got sufficiently organized to launch a magazine, Socialist Alternatives. 
It was highly artisanal affair, entirely financed by the IRMT from Paris. I wrote atrociously, as uh, the new statesman uh, correctly uh, said, and are translated just as atrociously, most of it, under a handful of pen names, mostly Harry Curtis and uh, John Walter. And, you know, I did everything, the typesetting on a small table of a uh, diminutive bedsit and took it to the printers sometimes with Emma Foot once. We uh, put uh, the latest issue in the back of um, Kier's, uh, what, what's this called? This mini, uh, got a special name anyway. Oh yeah, Countryman. And we drove all the way to Nottingham to uh, stopping in every left-wing book bookshop we could find. And also to meet Ken Coates and Ken Tarbuck of the Institute for Workers Control, which we uh, admired much at the time. But anyway, all was done in this extremely um, artisanal and mostly incompetent way when it comes to my ability to distribute uh, magazines and stuff. So no one read it as a result. So here's what you know. I wrote for the first editorial. I'll just read it and hopefully it's not too atrociously written. A gaping space for a socialist alternative has opened. It is a socialist job to try and develop it by both taking seriously the concerns and demands of the new social movements and concretely working towards a radical extension of popular control over wealth and power. This can only be achieved by building a new kind of alliance from the bottom up, integrating both the traditional wing of the labor movement and the new social movements. Clearly, such a project fundamentally at odds with the Labour Party leadership's present economic strategy, which provides no real alternative to Thatcherite economics, only a difference of degree. Socialist, socialist practice stems from one's vision of socialism. To us, socialism means the generalized self-management of society as a whole. This implies that it is only through the self-organization and self-activity on their own terms by the different oppressed sections of society that humanity will liberate itself from all forms of exploitation, sexual and racial, as well as economic. Socialist practice must accordingly be geared towards uniting all those in struggle against the capitalist system and fostering their self-organization. Gone are the days when a self-proclaimed vanguard could hope to lead the struggle to its victorious end. Groups and parties fighting for socialism should, in their structure as in their practice, prefigurate the type of social organization they claim to be fighting for. In effect, then, one of the most pressing tasks of the socialist movement is patient and principled work at all levels of society to make socialism and with it feminism, ecology, and anti-racism the common sense of our age. To develop such a common sense, the widest debates and a willingness to reconsider critically the tablets of stone of socialism in the light of the evolution of society is central. So that is again, you know, putting across this general Pabloite worldview that I explained earlier. And also we thought, and in, I would say in the shadow of Gramsci, because in some ways, I think we took a somewhat similar starting point from Eurocommunism, which in the UK was represented by uh, Marxism today. And uh, the left, you know, the idea was that the left was engaged in a long war of positions, certainly in uh, Western countries, in which a new a hegemony had to be built. It needed to break out of the traditional working class trenches, which were most often uh, defeated or sometimes even captured by the ruling class, to build alliances across society, reaching out new social movements and plural social identities. In contrast to Marxism today, we sought to build a revolutionary hegemony firmly based in a class analysis and the necessity of the social ownership and self-managed control of the means of production. We sought a path to advance a new revolutionary socialist hegemony that would combine aspirations to individual flourishing and autonomy with uncompromising class analysis. Our means were limited intellectually even more than materially. Few members of our collective showed much interest in theory. We remained dependent on Maurice Najman and Pablo's political intuitions and lacked the ability or 
reach, uh, yeah, uh, the ability to reach out, sorry, to make much of an impact. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, I we had a whole issue on what we meant by the alternative. And I wrote a piece that when I reread it, didn't look too stupid. But basically, we wanted to lean on this idea of the partial aims of different movements, what they wanted uh, uh, as their first aim uh, to form a new political identity for socialists to build a new revolutionary subject and a new socialist politics based on the material relations and clearly opposed to capitalist exploitation. And also using new social contradictions to build a project with hegemonic ambitions as an alternative to both Keynesianism and neoliberalism. Reclaiming democracy and autonomy from market and personal identity from egotistic individualism. So kind of using the same ideas, but in a, um, progressive revolutionary way. And um, economically speaking, we, we had lots to do with um, economics. We sought to think about economics differently, advancing critiques of productivism and the Fordist organization of labor and promoting direct social control of workplaces and production. We also warned against the financialization of the economy, which today is the bane of the whole world, I believe. We looked for and amplified concrete experiments in self-management, such as alternative workers' plans and popular planning, which were actually very advanced in the UK uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. We promoted the work of French economist Alain Lipiet, who was advocating for a radical alternative to the uh, neoliberal turn of the French socialists at the time with an emphasis on socially useful investment and work, workplace participation in management, uh, self-management in effect. Our last issue also carried a piece by a French economist warning against the financialization of neoliberal economies the world over and calling for an international conference to establish a new cooperative international financial system, which I think is still useful, but maybe uh, the BRICS will, uh, will get us there somehow. I eventually turn more to economics after joining an investment bank in 1987, uh, coming out of Oxford. And I brought my economics focus to uh, the Green Party when I joined it. Uh, socialist alternatives, just as uh, you know, Pablo uh, was looking to the South, taking uh, with an interest in what was going on in uh, anti-colonial movements, we pressed uncompromising support for decolonial movements and their armed struggles, and looked at international experiences with an open mind as sources of inspiration and lessons to be learned in building new national and international alliances. We did not write about international issues, but in fact, any issues with a view to proving our analysis right, much less to promote Pabloite groups or figures abroad, but in the good faith hope of promoting cross pollination pollination of ideas and of movements across uh, the North and South. We also paid close attention to potential positive developments in the USSR and satellites. We published an interview with Yasek Kuran, who insisted we, uh, uh, the US should absolutely uh, keep its nuclear weapons until the uh, USSR accepted neutralization of the whole of Eastern Europe. And a really uh, interesting piece, I think it was might have been the first time uh, in the UK we published Boris uh, Kagalitsky, who reported on a conference at the time of uh, the perestroika of um, opposition left groups that called for uh, leaving government owned enterprises to their employees and democratizing planning. So a move towards self-management. And that came on the back of also, though uh, we didn't cover it so much because it was uh, already uh, in the past, but the um, experiments in Poland with um, Solidarność, which at first had the possibility of, uh, well, certainly had a program for a self-managed republic and the um, workers' control of production and also a political democratization uh, fight that soon uh, 
lost to the more um, conservative and uh, Catholic and eventually, I think, uh, American-influenced uh, currents. So faithful to uh, Pablo's own trajectory, socialist alternatives sought to eschew a Western-centric approach in its search for socialism and looked to the world through a pluralistic revolutionary lens, including support for anti-colonial and anti-imperialist armed struggle. Um, what about the Palestine question? Well, we were uncompromisingly anti-Zionist and firmly opposed to anti-Semitism. This is a picture page I put in the last magazine when Le Pen made a comment saying that the gas chambers were a detail of um, the Second World War that really got me because it's not a detail in my view. And um, in a, a September 1987 analysis, I actually concluded, so that was before the first Intifada, I concluded that a mass movement from the interior was the only way forward. So for once the historical movement was kind enough to follow my advice. I'm joking, of course. Uh, our last issue had the uh, first intifada on the cover. This is the one, by the way, that's not available on the internet. I'm going to try and put it there when I somebody um, scans it for me. And a full dossier, including my analysis of the situation, the uh, declaration of the uh, Palestinians of the interior, a report on an attempt to organize a um, ship of return by a socialist society uh, comrade, and a piece by uh, General Mati Peled who was a, one of the leading generals uh, of the victory of 1967 for the Zionists, who had then turned to um, argue for um, a historical compromise uh, negotiations and the creation of a two-state solution uh, to no avail, but um, is also the father of uh, Miko Peled, who uh, took his father's idea uh, further by becoming a very strong anti-Zionist and calling today for a one state, which I totally agree with also. Uh, we called rightly at the time Israel as a client of the US. We warned against negotiations aimed to find collaborators to police and administer the occupied territories that eventually became the Palestinian Authority, of course. We called for a combination of armed struggle on the borders and non-armed struggle a non-armed resistance from the interior and the dialogue with progressive Israeli forces, as well as diplomatic pressure on the US. I don't know if there are any progressive Israeli forces left. I doubt it, but there you go. And so this question of Palestine remains extremely present for me. And you can see me here on one of the many weekly demos with my 11 year old son who uh, hopefully is also, well, is a scary also uh, inspired by that. The socialist uh, alternatives experiment came at a horrible time for the uh, British left and uh, the European left in general, but I basically arrived in the middle of the minor strike when it was very clear uh, it would be defeated. And then we had the whopping strike, which also was defeated. Then we had the assault on the GLC and all the labor left councils that also got defeated. And uh, the alternative workers plan also faded away. The peace movement stalled. And uh, in that general context, we saw a rise of the Greens and also an extension of really hard neoliberal ideological assault that had first been uh, premiered in Chile and that thanks to Thatcher and Reagan was going to uh, take over most of the world until a few years ago when it started being pushed back with some strength. We did report on those retreats, urging a forward facing inclusive inclusive left that would go beyond uh, the simple arithmetic addition of grievances, movements, and clients, which we felt had been the case with, for example, some of those uh, left-wing municipal uh, experiments, and urging you know, the movement to become ever more participative and 
graphic geometry, that's even a word. We critically supported the uh, Socialist Conference, which was an attempt around Tony Benn to try and bring um, different groups and movements together. It wasn't that successful. I don't think the left was able to break out from just looking back. Uh, Eric Heffer made some interesting attempts to articulate something, but in actual fact, I don't think it came to anything. Interestingly, when um, Corbyn got in, you know, the idea resurfaced with having a movement outside the party and inside the party, and that was what momentum was supposed to be. But as you know, uh, in practice, things turned out extremely differently. As a very small group, we sought alliances and collaborated with the Socialist Society in particular, I have to say without much success. Um, possibly the lack of success came, I mean, we weren't that far away in terms of our way of thinking, but I think personal stuff got in the way. Uh, there was a sense that because we were members of this international tendency, maybe we would be, we were expected to behave like other groups who were joining movements to basically sell the newspaper or recruit members, which was really never uh, what we were about. And more generally, I think, uh, you know, as an autistic person, I'm just absolutely hopeless at all the very subtle social interactions that um, seem to be essential for politics at any kind of level. So I think that also kind of uh, stood in our way. Um, but in general, in the whole of Europe, the left was on the retreat, and we saw two parallel processes, you know, a slight slide to the right, which was the biggest one. And on the other side, a hopeless uh, inward and backward looking retreat to the socialist left tradition and certainties. And that could have opened the space for, you know, an innovative radical alternative on the left, but it actually somehow um, kind of choked that space. However, you know, looking around Europe, we could see that Greens were making uh, electoral headway. And in particular in Germany, they looked as though they could prefigure uh, some alternative left, some uh, new uh, revolutionary subject. And uh, in, uh, in the UK, the Green Party seemed also promising at, at a smaller level. But for example, I was, uh, you know, um, lucky to meet uh, Derek and uh, and others and got a sense that there were possibilities in the um, in the UK Greens also. And so a number of us at the uh, level of the international tendency, including uh, Maurice Najman, advocated for a clear turn towards the Green parties, which Pablo had never done. He had always taken very early on uh, ecology as a central uh, preoccupation as a central uh, point in, in revolutionary thinking, but uh, somehow it seemed that for him, you know, joining the Green parties was a bridge too far and he objected. And that led to an absolutely disastrous and for me profoundly demoralizing international conference in Paris in 1988. Now, Derek, I don't actually remember if you were there if you were, you no, you weren't, okay. <laughs> but anyway, it was a complete disaster. I mean, there were like 12 of us, I think, from the UK. There were many of us, like, uh, and I was really looking forward to that. And uh, it, was a, it was a nightmare because, yeah. Um, it's like suddenly uh, Michel Pablo had opened this path for us and uh, this path had been extremely inspiring to me and to others, suddenly shut it down in a way that I, I still cannot totally understand uh, after all these years. But uh, all I can say is personally, I came back uh, totally uh, 
broken hearted, I think would be the word and demoralized that we, you know, I could still be part of an international tendency. Still, I joined the UK Greens. I allied with uh, Derek Wall and Penny Camp. I think it's right that I was briefly on the executive. Now I'm speaking under your uh, your control. And, uh, and I think I also drafted the Greens economic plan just because as a investment banker at the time, I had access to these Everybody has them now, but you know, to the prefigurations of Excel and stuff. And so I was able to run some numbers. And uh, that was before going back to France in 1990 or 91, if uh, memory serves. So, uh, oh God, yeah. So, where we really a talking shop, like the economist said, I actually take exception to that. First, because personally, I wasn't just talking. For example, uh, I traveled to Portugal in the summer of 1984 to kickstart the international solidarity campaign for Otelo de Carvalho, who had been arrested at the time on charges of uh, domestic terrorism. Uh, that campaign will eventually be successful. And I think uh, Michel managed to get Otelo freed in uh, 1990. I was also active in organizing UK visits for Ben Bella when he uh, was uh, released from so first jail and then a house arrest. And Pierre Juquin, who was uh, the um, uh, dissident from the Communist Party that actually stood in the 1988 um, presidential election in France and whose main counselor, if you like, uh, was uh, Maurice Najman. So, had a program very close to uh, to our positions. Uh, we also attended conferences and meetings, uh, such as I said before, the Socialist Conference and the Socialist Society, with a view, really honestly, an honest view to collaborating, not at all to building our, our organization. Later on, in my brief stint in the UK Greens, so I did the alternative budget and I remember reading in the Financial Times, I don't have the actual quote, but something to the effect that the Greens budget was the only one from all the other parties that clearly spelled out who would win and who would lose. So I, I really like that. You know, it's, I think it's made my day in my life that I was, uh, my work was quoted um, in a positive light in the Financial Times. I mean, well, that's, you know, could you want from a political life? So um, to look a little bit at what we, you know, social self-management, but publicism, pabloism, however you want to call it, more generally got right, in my view. I think turning to anti-imperialism and decolonialism was certainly the right thing to do. And you know, the fourth international and pabloism did it from the uh, 1950s onward and much faster than the uh, official communist movement, the uh, Stalinist communist movement. Feminism, anti-patriarchy and liberation from sexual repression. So that started really from Pablo's 1960 uh, jail prison essay onward, I think was really, you know, getting this right so early is magnificent. Sexual liberation and gay rights, again, around the same time was also something that, you know, I think we can be absolutely proud of. Worker self-management and radical democracy to me is still is the content of socialism, like bridges, makes the bridge between um, libertarian ideas and uh, actual, you know, revolutionary uh, Marxist uh, practice at least. Uh, so that started, you know, in the 60s in Algeria, then in Chile in the 1970s, in Poland in the 80s. Uh, oh, I forgot, um, of course, the inspiration for this, which was Yugoslavia. I'm sorry. Uh, ecology also, you know, uh, Pablo clearly has put it at the center of the socialist project in the early 70s, which in terms of, you know, the Revolutionary left was certainly groundbreaking. Animal rights also, we uh, took a position for this in Socialist Alternatives in 1987. I've actually been, uh, I've remained a lifelong vegetarian since uh, 1985. And what also I, I believe we got right was this vision of expanding the revolutionary struggle and seeking to build a new hegemony. Uh, 
also right to this commitment to revising our ideas and understanding the changing nature of capitalist political economy, imperialism and oppression. Also right, I think a realist vision of existing movements combining support for the smaller steps while promoting the full program, not just as propaganda, but by all practical steps. And uh, finally, a distrust of messianic vanguardism, bureaucratism, sectarian organizational chauvinism, and frenetic propagandistic activism, yet a commitment to the revolutionary process. What we got wrong or I got wrong. Illusions about the green movement, but if we look at the history of uh, Pabloism as a current, and I'm sure of many, um, revolutionary currents over the 20th century. And let's say that revolutionary or misplaced revolutionary optimism is uh, a flow that many, many of us uh, shared. And certainly uh, we had, I, I had these illusions about the green movement and probably much too optimistic. Uh, a naivety towards the impact of imperialist infiltration and recuperation of anti-communist forces. So that's my personal view, but I think in trying to be anti-Stalinist and uh, anti-imperialist, the window is extremely small. And uh, of course, uh, you know, the imperialist uh, will come into that place uh, the CIA and its different arms. And I think we were a little bit naive about this. I think our naivety was also proved right by the retreat of, uh, you know, rights and uh, conditions for the majority in Western Europe and in all over the world since the, the end of the, of the Soviet Union. We also go wrong, we really fail to pay close attention to and to understand the trajectory of socialist China. I've been looking at this more closely myself, and I must say that I am really impressed. Uh, you know, you take 800 million people out of poverty in 20 years, you have a society which is not self-managed, but highly participative, where people can actually uh, complain about their government and things will get done where people feel the government is working for them and where clearly capital is not holding the levers of political uh, power. And there is something to be learned there. And uh, it's interesting because, you know, the, the experiment to me is certainly positive and I would have wanted to pay closer attention to it. Although in the early 80s, you know, in the full uh, early years of Deng, it really looked just like, oh, we're gonna be a capitalist and nothing else. But I think now we're seeing something much more subtle, which uh, I wish we'd been able to, um, to imagine at the time. Uh, what we got wrong was the absolutely disgraceful, sorry collapse of the uh, IRMT idea. 1988 Paris conference. That was, that made no sense. And uh, yeah, anyway, it sticks, in, it still sticks in my crow, personally. I also think, uh, you know, the, the flip side of not trying to build your organization and not being sectarian and not trying to get your people to sell the newspaper and to recruit was, of course, that, you know, we didn't, we lacked an interest in organizational building. And uh, so focusing on spreading and evolving ideas regarding identifying and contributing formation of a new revolutionary subject, turns out that eventually you don't have anybody to do this with anymore. So I think we you know, went too far in the other direction, but it's better this way than the other way, I guess. And finally, what we got wrong or one of our main weaknesses was that, was that we were an absolutely minuscule group organized by really at the end of the day by and around me and much of our weakness reflected my own personal limitations of which there are very many my social naivety and my difficulties in navigating the more subtle social aspects of politics which now i have come to realize are really a function of my being statistic 
Uh, so if we go back to this whole experiment, the, the more, more generally the Pabloite experiment or Pablo's vision, and we take the long view, this is what I take out of it and I still value in many ways. The goal of revolutionary socialist politics is a radical social and political democracy, also known as the self-managed republic, a free association of humans who control and manage their individual lives and identities, as well as their means of social and cultural reproduction and their interactions with nature on a local and global scale. It can only be established through prefigurative practices that guard against the dangers of bureaucratization and the crystallization of a new parasitic social strata. Marxism is an experimental theory. Its politics are not, not the blind unfolding of iron loads. Our praxis and analytic tools need to remain open to the changing expressions of class contradictions on a world scale. So in the advanced capitalist countries, it was first cat capital versus labor, then became uh, imperialism versus labor, plus the peasantry leading to the Russian revolution, then imperialism versus labor, plus peasantry, plus colonized people, plus social identities, plus individual aspirations. And finally, imperialism versus all of the above, plus sovereignty, which I believe is the central contradiction today. The uh, development of productive forces and social imagination are in constant dialectical interaction. The transition to socialism may not be at the scale of a human lifetime, or it may come faster, depending both on the states of the contradictions and the availability of broad revolutionary forces catalyzing the move towards radical self-managed social and political democracy. And one thing about Pabloism that's kind of striking when you look back at its uh, political history is it identified the moments, it identified the possibility, but there was never a force to carry it forward. And in it itself as a current was never that force. So there is something there that we missed that we are probably still missing, but we got the analysis right and we knew what to do, but we had no one to do it with, which is also, of course, a problem of the analysis in the um, final analysis, as they would say in uh, Marxist circles. So um, Marxism, Leninism, Trotskyism, Pabloism, if you want to call it that, that are moments in this unfolding dialectical movement leading to new formulations and perspectives. The task remains to build an international association of revolutionaries ready to merge and recompose itself with forces of the global emancipatory political social movement of our time. We need to be willing to enter and participate into processes and movements without hegemonic or controlling ambitions, advancing our full program and supporting every step along the way consistently advocating for the self-managed republic and appealing to the general interests of humanity. My God, this is so inspiring. And just to conclude on a bit of a joke. So this is from one of our issues, right? Uh, a strong armed defense is more necessary than ever to prevent Holocaust at the hands of either the Zionists or reactionary Arabs. It is far from clear that an armed struggle. So long live the glorious armed struggle of the Palestinian people. And uh, I wanted to share this from Twitter. Breaking news, Sir Ker Ker Starmer gets emailed an automatic exclusion letter for editing Socialist Alternatives magazine, a front magazine for the international revolutionary Marxist tendency between 86 and 88 that actually supported the armed struggle against the Zionist enemy. Finally, a few references. There is an archive of socialist alternatives grace, uh, graciously provided by this website, BritishPabloismWordPress.com. I will one day when I get it scanned by the person who has it sent the last issue. Uh, there are some texts of uh, Michel Baptiste Pablo in the Marxist org, a wonderful online archive that you probably all know. And also a Nick a great book that uh, Derek reviewed recently by uh, Hal Greenberg, who was a longtime Pabloite from uh, Australia and one of the uh, founders of the um, Australian Green Party, I believe. Uh, that is called The Well-Dressed Revolutionary, uh, The Odyssey of Michel Pablo in the Age of Uprisings. It's just come out and it's a great book. It's like 
the story of uh, Michel and his ideas and his times, it's critical and at the same time you understand the uh, the ideas, it's it's one of the very good uh, political biographies I have read. Of course, I'm a little bit biased as I really love the man, but there you go. Neville Alexander has also a page on the um, Marxist org. Uh, Maria Beckett has a website that you may want to visit. And uh, Ellen Malos, there is a pamphlet or a text of her also uh, on this British uh, Pablo Isma files wordpress.com. So that is the end of my presentation. I'm five minutes beyond what I was hoping to uh, do. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll do my best to uh, fill them now. Thanks, Ben. Can you point me back to the host now, please? <laughs> I will do that. Thank you. Let me see. So uh, that was very interesting, by the way, Ben. And, uh, very comprehensive, which is good. We don't always have uh, that kind of presentation uh, level, so that was I'm impressed. So uh, people can sort of speak or um, put your hand up in the thing or whatever. Lawrence Black, good to see you. Lawrence, go ahead. Hi, um, Keith. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Um, that was a, that was really fascinating. Um, it, I, I guess my question is 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 um, can you see any evidence that this um, brief moment in Starmer's political career th there's any sort of legacy of it in his activities um, today? Um, I, I'll throw in a, a, a second question if that's acceptable. Um, question. Halfway through the talk, I suddenly thought of um, Tariq Ali's novel, Redemption. And it struck me that quite a lot of the way in which you were describing Pablo and the Pabloist movement, I mean, it resonates with that sort of, you know, comic, but I think actually more serious than, it, than he lets on, comic sort of portrayal of um, uh, Trotskyism. There is, a, there is a thinly veiled Pablo character in the novel i think he's called diablo um uh, any thoughts on on that i've never quite known what to make of that novel actually but um so any legacy in starmer today and okay right thanks Lawrence. Uh, fascinating questions on the first one i would say i don't see any i read some what I would call BS around the time of the leadership election, where, you know, uh, as a way to garner some left votes, some operators that I would doubt the uh, political honesty of put this across, but I see absolutely no sign of it. There is, a, there is something strange about here in general, you know, I mentioned it before, like, it's a mystery to me how he went from being a militant to a Pabloite in weeks. Like, I don't remember, you know, normally when you recruit someone from another tendency, it takes a while. You need to go through lots of stuff. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but you, you know, there's so many things to look at and you need to go through all of them. And I have no recollection of doing this with him. So that's kind of strange. I've noticed that, you know, he's no no one is mentioning that he was, I don't know if he was a member of the militant. All I know is, you know, we saw him do that. There's this John Pike who was with us at um, the OULC who's done this Twitter thread where he said he was never a militant because they were together in the Young Socialist before uh, Keir went to Leeds. So I'm guessing, you know, it's in Leeds that he got interested in those guys. And so the, the strange thing, I was listening a few days ago to Henri Weber. So I don't know if you know who Henri Weber were, is he was one of the leaders of the... Um, of, <laughs> official Pabloites, I mean, to LCR in France, right, with Alain Crivin and Daniel Ben Said, they were the three 
emerging leaders in 68 and Henri Weber joined the Socialist Party in 1981 and he's become this, you know, uh, social democrat, uh, pro-Zionist and everything. But he has a story behind it. Like he, he can talk about his political evolution and what didn't work and what, you know, where he disagreed and the double power. And the, there is a sense of intellectual evolution. It's also, you know, a political treason for some of us, but there is a sense of it. In Kiev, I, I haven't really spoken to him since, you know, since those days, but the few times he's referred to it, it's just disparaged it. Like, you know, I remember an interview with this um, Robinson character on the BBC where I just laughed because he had used the word oppressed. And then this other thing where he says, oh, I had some daft ideas. But I really don't get a sense of intellectual evolution, for lack of a better word. So it, which means, which to me means the guy is actually an empty suit. I don't know how to say it any other way, but I don't think he's a master. I think he's just a puppet uh, saying whatever is being told to say and is going to be the worst you've ever seen. That is my personal view of it. And I say it on a political level because, you know, personally, I really like the guy. And in fact, I liked him so much that I refused to talk to any of his official biographers. And this is kind of the first time I talked publicly about him. Well, I've, I've, I've shit posted about him on Twitter because I, you know, every day it seems he's able to insult our intelligence and morals in a new way, which is beyond comprehension. Uh, I won't be able to speak to uh, the f any figure in Tari Kali's um, novel simply because I haven't read it. But I will say something about Michel is that all his life he was involved in actual action. Like he, you know, the problem of Trotsky's movements is that it's been really hard to actually get involved in mass action. You know, if you talk about mass action, anything other than doing big demos or something, right? And uh, that was that was something he did all his life, you know, to uh, to some effect, but mostly as a kind of counselor of princes in a sense, because there was no movement behind him, but at the same time, a real will and actual, you know, practice of being involved and studying movements, not just um, being on the sidelines uh, commenting. So no, it, I, I wouldn't call him a comical figure for that because he was highly, you know, for his role, for all the feelings and the feelings are those of the uh, progressive revolutionary movement in general. He, he was a highly respected guy and had friends all over the world. So comical would not be the word I would put to him. Misguided maybe or naive or, you know, always... Uh, being over optimistic about the next uh, revolutionary potential, absolutely. But comical, but maybe that's comical, depending on your point of view. I I hope that answers your your question, uh, Lawrence. Okay, thanks. More points. We've got to a little while. If there are other questions. We'll see who we've got on that might wish to. Alfie. Um, hi, thank you ever so much for that. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm I'm working on a project which uh, a PhD project which looks at a lot of the stuff with um the socialist conference and the socialist society. So um I was just you mentioned how you were involved in it, but obviously kind of it wasn't a complete success were, were any connections formed there um with other people not a part of the power white movement did that carry on did any kind of positive relationships come from that and i suppose what influence did it have on the green party because i'm interested in the association of socialist greens obviously derek will know a lot about as well um i wonder if you tell me a little bit about that so when it comes to socialist society you know, I had the connection with Hillary Wainwright before I really came to to Oxford, 
Uh, but when we actually did get involved with the socialist society, it it, it didn't go well. You know, I'd say I, I felt they hated my guts. I don't know how to put it any other way. There was this guy called Barney. I forget his name now. I saw it the other day. Who, I don't know, you know, I felt like we were treated as this, and I remember some people complaining about us being members of, uh, you know, an international tenancy, and John Palmer comes to mind, and and it just wasn't productive, like, I, I felt we weren't understood, and as I say, you know, I think my lack of social understanding is also a part of that, but it was just not, not fruitful. So it's hard to say. Uh, uh, politically speaking, if I have to make a political appreciation of the difference in, is I think, well, speaking of talking shop, it felt to me like they were more interested in talking about stuff and we were interested in talking, advancing ideas and also getting into movements. So I think that, that that's kind of the difference, but you know, is it a distinction with that difference? Because there were so few of us that I, I'm not too sure what getting into movements could really mean, <laughs> practically, because <laughs> there were only 24 hours in my day, and um, you know, I was certainly the most active. And so that would have been the political difference if there was one. And also, I think, and Derek could speak to this, but maybe they changed over time, but we were much more open to seeing the Green Party as a place where we could do, uh, you know, alternative um, socialist revolutionary politics. So that, that that would have been another difference. As for the socialist conference, I can't actually remember. I can't remember yet, you know, I, I haven't looked at this stuff for many, many years, but looking at the socialist alternatives uh, uh, issues and stuff, and it says I was uh, some, I had some kind of place on the socialist conference, whatever. Uh, but my general recollection is it was just, you know, at the time, it's like almost like the Benite wing just closed down, closed down and closed down onto its certainties and onto party struggle. And it just felt like there was no, no air in that thing. But that's just a very subjective feeling, Alfie, because uh, I don't actually have any biographical memory of doing anything the socialist conference though i know i went there and uh, whatever yeah so that's i, I hope that uh, right. Derek. yeah thank you ben for that um i mean really inspiring um, um and very nuanced and uh, you know some of it went wrong but um well wasn't it great to be involved in all this <laughs> Um, you know, kind of really kind of creative. So I don't know how much I can add. I mean, my, I mean, I tend to be kind of very dull and dogmatic. I'm interested in like sort of ecological Marxism. Um, and what I kind of found with social self-management, I, I spent a long time tracking it down because I, I kind of was very conscious that there was something in Marxism, which is essential to kind of green politics, but it wasn't really being articulated um, and in Chippenham Library in Wiltshire, when I was like a teenager, I read this book called The Self-Managing Environment by Alan Roberts, who was a prominent Australian Pablo, Pabloite. And I really yeah. liked the way that he linked like Marxist analysis and ecology and self-management. And when I was a student in London, I came across the self-management papers written by somebody called Harry Curtis in Compendium. And then couldn't trace that um, socialist alternative, recognizing it was sort of Pablo White eco socialist publication. I'd get from um, Full Marks, I'm going to get very boring soon, in Bristol. And then it didn't come out. And I said to them, Is it coming out? And they said, Oh, one of our staff is an editor. So I met John, John Malice and uh, Ellen Malice. Mm -hmm. and was, um, like older generation of Pabloites who'd been active in the Algerian revolution, um, you know, were, were very, very focused on ecology. Um, my wife's just come in and she no normally sees me ranting about ecology. And, um, you know, they're very, very good on ecological politics and they've had like hands on revolutionary politics in Algeria and Neville Parkinson as well. Um, probably should, should shut up. I mean, I, 
Um, so it kind of, for me, fulfilled a sort of intellectual link to an ecological Marxism. Um, you know, this century I bumped into Hugo Blanco, who I think is similar to Michel Pablo, the late great Hugo Blanco. And I was going to ask Ben if he was it, he'd come across Hugo Blanco. And I'm, I'm kind of most engaged with people who sort of come out at the moment, kind of Marxist Leninist traditions in places like Rojava, mm. completely different traditions, but in many ways they've got very parallel politics to um, the Pabloids. So I probably don't, shouldn't get into the Alliance of Green Socialism, but um, Ben, you remember we had like intense, evil factional struggles in the Green Party in the late 80s against people like um, Sarah Parkin, who of course lived in oh. Lyon, um, and the oh, God, yeah, the neoliberals on one uh, side and the uh, David Ikes on the other, right? Yeah, and, and this is going to, so I don't really, you know that, that Penny Kemp is no longer with us, but she was such a sort of support. So you, you got linked in with all of us kind of socialists in the uh, the Green Party. <laughs> that was fun. Thanks. I, I, no, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not familiar with uh, Hugo Blanco's work. I, I might have a look, though. Thanks for flagging it. Okay, we've still got time Apart for... That, yeah. Sorry? Absolutely. Yeah. So we've still got uh, a little bit of time if anybody else wants to dance again. Go ahead. Sorry. I'm coming back to the same question. If Pablo is a Zelig character, is Starmer yeah. a Zelig character i mean i i totally understood your answer it's, it's very frustrating that you can't plot and he won't plot his political trajectory but i guess there's a certain electoral asset to that isn't there most people wouldn't be too bothered about that so is he is he a sort of shape-shifting politician a sort of zelly it, it's kind of hard you know uh, i so I, I, I totally dropped out of politics in, I don't know, what, 91 or something, 92. I went back to France. I joined the Green Party there, and it was horrible. And I just completely dropped out. And, you know, and, and I'm now a, a clinical psychologist. So I don't, I don't regard him as a political character more as a clinical case, not case, but you know, it's more like, I, I see it more under a psychological lens, maybe, you know, my new professional deformation or something, but I, the most I can say is, you know, empty suits for me is the word that comes. I don't actually think is his own person. I think, uh, you know, other interests out there hand firmly up but, his backside and they will- That can be an electoral asset, can't it? Oh, whatever, yeah, yeah, for sure. But I don't know what you mean by electoral asset. I think at this point, you know, you could run any, I mean, like it's pretty wooden, right? It's not like so um, inspiring. At this point, you could run a donkey and uh, he would probably still, you know, with, with, with the uh, authoritarian... Uh, thugs behind him you could just get them get anyone through no i don't know if there's anything special about clear that you know he ran a campaign saying i'm uh corbyn plus and it, it was just a pack of lies you could have run anyone else i i i i fail to see him as a wily operator maybe i'm missing something you know maybe i'm just but that this is my pers my perspective on We'll see. I think time will tell soon enough, right? <laughs> There's an interesting book, I think, it's by Oliver Eagleton, which is a kind of biography of Starmer, um, which looks um, at his time, uh, particularly when he was director of public prosecutions and kind of, um, you know, suggests there was some kind of turning going on at, at that point, which is kind of interesting. Um, you know, people to get into a position of significant authority and uh, you know, consciousness, um, material being, and so on. So. Yeah, that's that. That's when you grow up, Keith. They, it's called <laughs> growing up. <laughs> well, I haven't yet succeeded. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
Stop the same plan. <laughs> yeah, okay. Any more questions? That uh, happened to me. I haven't, I haven't had that chance yet. Maybe you never know. You know. No, no, no. One day. Uh, I well, yes. Um, nobody else is indicating. So, and we are quite close. We normally finish at seven. So, um, I think we'll one last chance. But uh, no, okay. Well, thanks very much, Ben. That was really interesting. Hopefully, the recording. Uh, will work. I'll, I'll have a look at that, and if uh, if okay, I'll ping it over to you for you to have a look at as well to make sure you're okay with it. But uh, otherwise, um, thanks a lot, and no I'm doubt okay uh, I'll see you on Twitter. <laughs> of course. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank for you. having me, yes. here and uh, it was fun. Thanks. Cool. Lovely to see you again, Derek. It's been such a long time. Maybe we we can do it. Yeah, again, you have to. Too. And we'll uh, we'll get together. I'm I'm still doing very similar things that I used to. I'm I'm very very dull, really. <laughs>